Amen. It's good to be here tonight. Good to see you all in this wonderful Florida weather we're having here. Don't complain. Um, I'll be um, speaking uh, in uh, a, a little church next Sunday morning up around um, the Lafayette, Indiana area. And um, I was talking to the pastor the other day, and he said they got an inch of snow the other night. And uh, so they're still getting snow up there. First time I went to Indiana, I, I couldn't believe it because it was so much colder up there. And I thought that I was basically just driving straight east. And when I look on the map, I'm going, nope, I'm going northeast. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting into God's country up there, ain't I? All right? That's that Minnesota stuff. All right, John chapter 11, take your Bibles, turn there. Uh, appreciate everybody, your prayers for us. We appreciate your prayers. Uh, we will be hitting the road tomorrow, and um, we'll be going up to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And um, I'll be, I don't know, I don't know anything about this church. I don't know if they live stream or not. Um, I think they might, um, but anyway, if, if they do, when I get up there, I'll try to find um, what they're streaming to, and I'll, tr I'll, I'll try to tweet that out, put it on Facebook, it'll end up on the church website, and uh, you'll be able to see it. Uh, I'm scheduled to speak uh, Friday afternoon and then Saturday evening, and um, right after I'm done Saturday evening, then we're going to drive from Fort Wayne back this way, and uh, the pastor's going to let us um, stay in, in, in his church parking lot, basically, and that's where we're going to park, and um, this is a, a new church. I don't know the pastor. I don't know the people of the church. Uh, Sister Tracy Rickard has been following our ministry for years. She's been attending there, and uh, she said, Pastor Mike, he's just like you and Reg Kelly. And I went, oh, no, that's bad. But anyway, you pray for us and pray that God will give us liberty and that we'll be able to share what God has blessed us with here and uh, maybe, uh, maybe bring some people in. Amen. So anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get too far into the scripture and get into the service. And I get all messed up and tongue tied because I haven't prayed. But uh, let's, let's go to the Lord tonight. We'll have our prayer time here in a little bit, and I'll give out some prayer requests. Let's go to the Lord tonight in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a joy to be in your house. I thank you, Lord, for gathering us tonight. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, for getting us through another day. Lord, there may be somebody here or somebody listening online, Lord, that's not had the best of days. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless them. Give them grace and give them the grace that is sufficient, Lord, for all their needs. And help us to understand, Father, that your grace is sufficient for everything. You know more about what we need than we do. And so, Father, we follow you. We gladly follow you. We trust you. You've given us so many reasons why we should trust you. You've never given us a reason to turn back, to turn around, to go the other way. So, Father, we're thankful for that. I pray, dear God, that you would bless all of these, Lord, that have gathered here tonight, both here in the building and online, those who listen to it throughout the week. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would open up our eyes uh, to your word, open up our eyes to our life. And Father, there's probably people, Lord, that we know and love that need to be saved. But there may be a reason why they're not coming to you. We may be the reason why. I know, Lord, you know me. Father, I've, I've done some harm in my life. My mouth has got me in great trouble. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would just lift that off whoever I may have offended in life. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless anybody, Lord, who might consider me an enemy or not their friend, not somebody who cares. I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would save them. God, show us uh, some good things out of your word tonight. 
Prepare us, Father, for days to come. Give us wisdom and understanding on days that have already passed. We just ask your blessings now upon your word. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for this book. Help us to follow it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. You recognize, of course, this is the story of, of Jesus' friend, Lazarus. Um, there has always been a question in my mind if this was the same Lazarus that um, is mentioned in Luke chapter 16, the poor man who died outside of the rich man's house. I tend to think that they are two separate people. Um, how many people do you know named Larry? There's a few Larrys you know, okay? So uh, Lazarus, like, sort of like Mary. How many Marys are there in the Gospels? At least three that I can think of right off the bat, okay? So anyway, uh, you got Mary and Martha here. You have Mary Magdalene. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus. And those are sort of the uh, Greek Roman versions of the name Miriam. Well, Miriam then was Moses' sister. So Miriam or Mary was a common name. And I'm reasonably sure Lazarus probably was too, as so many Jewish names are. So I uh, it, probably, in my opinion, probably not the same Lazarus. But anyway, we know that this Lazarus is a friend of Jesus. We've read down to the point where we know that Jesus was instructed days ahead of time that Lazarus was sick and that he was probably close to dying. They sent word to Jesus compelling him or asking him to come and to lay his hand upon Lazarus and to heal Lazarus. And Jesus now, understand this, he had nothing against Lazarus. He loved him. And when, when we read that verse, uh, John eleven thirty five, 35, that, that wonderful verse, beautiful verse, shortest verse in the whole Bible, and I, I, I don't know exactly who, you know, divided up all the verses. But it must have just, whoever did that, it must have just reached out and grabbed them like it does me. And the Holy Ghost may have said, make that its own verse. Jesus wept. And in that one statement, you see the profound nature the love nature of Christ. And in fact, it's said in verse 36, when they see Jesus weeping, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And again, I marvel at this because Jesus knows, and he's known it all along, that he deliberately stayed where he was and not gone to Lazarus while he was alive. He deliberately allowed him to die knowing that he was going to go and resurrect him up from the grave. He's even standing now before the tomb of Lazarus. The stone is in place, sealing the tomb, and standing there knows that in five minutes or less, they're going to be unwrapping the whatever they had wrapped Lazarus in, and he's going to be breathing air again. He's going to be seeing again. He's, he's going to be whole and complete again, and, and maybe even young again. He knows this, but death stings. Death has a sting to it. The sting of death, of course, is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But to those, number one, if people say, I, I don't fear death, I almost promise you that if you were out somewhere and all of a sudden you grabbed your chest and you were in excruciating pain from having a heart attack and near to the point of death, I guarantee you, you're not going to be all smiles and cheer. Whoa, praise the Lord, I'm fixing to go home glory. You're not going to do that. It's going, to, it's going to affect you. The terrors of death, the Bible calls it. 
and to those then who are left behind after the death of somebody that they love. They deal with that then for the rest of their lives. And Jesus, being fully man, yet fully God, uh, there's a song that has that he was so much man that he uh, wept when Lazarus died, but he was so much God uh, that Lazarus came forth when Jesus cried. I'm going to have to sing that. That's a good song. Because uh, it talks about the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ. But here we see the humanity of Christ. This is his friend. He is reacting. He's not putting on a show. He's not faking anything. He's weeping. Why? Because he loves the people that he created. And he weeps. God shedding tears of sorrow and mourning. I don't know of any other religion that has a God that does that. That came to this earth and lived among us and wept when his, when his friend died. And so we pick it up in uh, verse 35 again. Jesus wept. Verse 36, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Question mark. And the answer, of course, is yes. We know that he could have. There have been times when I've said to God, God, you can do this. God, you can help this situation. God, you can turn this around. God, why don't you do this? God, why don't you do that? God, how come you're not fixing this? God, how come you're not helping that? That pops up a lot amongst God's people. And we ask God, why aren't you doing something? Why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? But the thing is, we don't see that maybe God has something far better than what we were thinking God could do. And he's waiting for the time when he's going to do that. And when he does it, then we go, thank you, God. Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself. Listen to that. Again, he's not putting on a theatrical drama here. He's not just making a scene for the people around him. Everybody going, oh, he's crying. Oh, he's such a compassionate man. He is groaning with himself, within himself. He cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Now, I told you last week, do some homework on this. Okay? Do some homework. Study stones in the Bible, rocks and stones, and what they represent, what they stand for. Okay? What is the meaning of this stone? So he says in verse 39, now listen to what he said. Listen very carefully to what he said. Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Now surely, Jesus being the God that he is, could have, you know, did one of these things. And the stone rolled away all by itself, right? Right? Okay, he could have snapped his fingers, the stone could have disappeared, whatever. He certainly could have moved the stone by himself being God. But understand something. Jesus isn't the one that put it there. They were. Mary, Martha, his friends, his family. They're the ones who put that stone in its place. And why? Because he's dead. He stinketh. We love him, but we can't have, we can't just keep him around. And so on and so on and so on. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead Four days. I'm not going to get into that, but I can tell you that's very dead. Okay, it is it is at a 
at the point where most people would not even want to see it, much less smell it or have anything to do with it. Okay? Trust me on this one. It's bad. A four-day-old dead body is bad. Jesus, and think of that number four now. What does that tell us? What does it represent? Number one, this is going to represent the gospel. The gospel is life from death. The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Everybody that you know that is lost is already dead. Okay? They are already dead. This is how God renders them. This is how God sees them. They are already dead, living a dead lifestyle, full of death things. And I'll tell you, in this, in, at this time in this world and in this culture, death seems to be very prominent now. Death, and in fact, we're almost getting, how can I say it? We're almost getting inoculated against death itself that is no that is no big thing to us uh anybody that's ever fought a war after a while you just get accustomed that the people that you're around are not going to make it and the, you're going to see death everywhere and it may horrify you at first and then after a while you just get hardened to it and i think this world is getting hardened to the idea of death um, the Bible says, says it this way, eat, drink, and marry, be married for tomorrow we, we may die. Uh, in today's world, you know, life is whatever and then you die. And in most people's minds, their death to them means nothing. It is the end of everything. They don't have anything to worry about after death, uh, which is what leads... Most people who commit suicide um, have reckoned in their mind that, that they're not, there's not anything after they die. There's no judgment, there's no God, there's no heaven, no hell. So I would just simply end my life and, and that's going to that's gonna solve my problems. One case I can think of was um, he was the former police chief of Festus, Missouri years ago. They actually featured his story in an episode of Law and Order. I recognized it. Um, <clears throat> after he retired from the Festus Police Force, uh, his name was Pagano. He um, uh, got into, he, he started a business of, um, I think, a private detective type business, security business, things like that. And he had his son-in-law, I believe it was, working for him at the time. Well, they got into some sort of, fight or something like that or there, there was something that just wasn't going well between the two and Pagano shot his son-in-law in the back well they had his trial <clears throat> and um, they of course found him guilty uh, he was claiming that it was in self-defense that his son-in-law had pulled a gun on him uh, but the forensics said, you know, anytime you shoot somebody in the back, it's generally not self-defense. But anyway, he tried that tactic and lost. The jury found him guilty despite his clout in the community and despite whatever money he had, they found him guilty. But he had decided he wasn't going to jail. And at that time in the state of Missouri, if you appealed your sentence, you could still apply to the court to be left out on bond even after you've been sentenced or been found guilty, if you're going to appeal the case, you could stay, under certain circumstances, you could stay out on bond. Well, they, they kept him out of jail. He didn't have to go to jail about being found guilty. And his lawyer was going to appeal the case. Well, that infuriated the people in the state of Missouri. And... The legislature went to work and I don't know, I don't remember exactly how it all happened, whether they passed a bill or a judge decided something or whatever. 
But all of a sudden now they said, no, we're not going to do this. It's not, this man was found guilty of murder. Murder. And he's found guilty. He should go to jail. And if he's going to appeal it, then we'll let him out if he wins the appeal. But he's been found guilty by 12 people. They all said he's guilty. He should go to jail. So whenever that came about, of course, the Jefferson County Sheriff's deputies went to the man's house, knocked on the door, and they said, you know, uh, Bill, you know why we're here. Uh, we've got to take you in. Uh, the court said so. And he said, well, let me go to the bathroom first. Give me, give me that decency. And they said, okay. They let him go in the bathroom. He pulled a gun out and shot himself. And that ended up on a, in a scene in Law and Order. Okay? Uh, made, it made headlines. His idea was, I'm going to escape judgment. Did he? He did not escape judgment. He is paying for his crimes right now. Now understand something. And all of us maybe have somebody that has done us dirty, done us wrong. Somebody that we just, we can't stand the fact that they're just living a certain lifestyle and getting away with it. And get, they get, it seems like people, some people get away with everything. Sounds like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? They get away with murder. They get away with everything. How come they can get their way and live like that and the rest of us can't? I'm telling you, there is a sure judgment coming to every man. Don't you worry. Because God's judgment and his wrath is far worse than anything man can do to somebody. Somebody say amen. Now, Jesus said, take you away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Uh, look at it like this. From the time Adam transgressed, and God said, in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. That's why Adam didn't die that afternoon. A day is a thousand years. Adam lived to 930 years. But he didn't live to a thousand years. Methuselah, 900, almost 31 years away, he could have celebrated his 1,000th birthday. But God said, in the day ye eat thereof, then you shall die. And so he, he died. 930 years old, but he died. From that time, from the day that Adam transgressed, his body, God separated him from the tree of life. He's as, he's as good as dead now. Do you know it was four days later that Christ came? If you count a day as a thousand years, it's 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. It was 400 years from the Old Testament, the last writer of the Old Testament, Malachi. 400 years from Malachi to Christ. See that number repeating again? Here, and so here, and, it, and from the time um, of Abraham, Unto now has been four days or 4,000 years. Okay? So I think all of that plays in there. Uh, but Jesus saith unto her in verse 40, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. And there could very well be a difference, people, between how we want God to do things versus how God is going to do it. But I promise you, if you will let God do it, it will work out far better for you Amen. than you trying to do it yourself or you trying to provoke God to do something or you get mad at God because he did this or did that and you didn't like it or whatever. Let God do it. Amen. Amen. What does that stone represent? Stones represent a lot of things. The foundation stone. The chief cornerstone. Christ is the stone that was cut without hands. That, that's seen in Daniel chapter 2. That destroys the uh, iron and miry clay. Uh, the fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. 
Uh, we then as lively stones, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, do make up the whole house of God. Each one of us has a part to play in making the house of God himself, the temple of God. We may be a big stone, a little stone, a foundation stone, a wall stone, the stone that's holding up the ceiling or whatever. But each one of us have our part to be in the kingdom of God. And what does one stone have to say about what another stone does? We don't have a say in that. God is the one who shapes the stone and works the stone and puts the stone where he wants it to do what he calls it to do. But in this case here, as I said, Brother, Brother Kelly preached this one time down in Harrison, Arkansas. And I don't think I've ever been more convicted over a message. In fact, he preached it. If I remember right, I think he preached it here in a revival years ago. What about a stumbling stone? And let me ask you a question. Have you ever hurt somebody's feelings? Now, I'm going to let you all in on a little secret, okay? I, I usually don't have too much of a problem telling you what all is wrong with Mike Hoggard. Boy, Derek, I'm glad you came tonight. You're going to have to fix this wheel again for me after church, all right? <clears throat> You're my wheel repair man, all right? You're my wheel man. I don't, I, don't, I don't mind telling you what all's wrong with me. One of the things that I know about me is that I'm way too easy to get my feelings hurt. Way too easy. God has made me aware of that, and I'm working on that. I really am. I'm trying to not to get blistered at everything that happens or if somebody says something that I don't like or whatever. That goes all the way back to my childhood, okay? I mean, it's a hang-up since I, you can ask my mom, my sister. My sister had to step in and tell big kids to leave me alone. Leave my brother, and they were scared of my sister. I didn't guarantee you that. Um, but I, I was, have always been bad about that. Getting my feelings hurt. And as an adult, I, I've had to learn, I guess, to let some things go after a while. Now I'm just working on trying not to be hurt to begin with. Just let, let things roll. Just let it go. Right then. But something else I'm also good at. Is that I am very good at offending people. Very good at it. I don't like it. I do it sometimes even without realizing it. I had an experience when I was in Bible college. Um, the Bible college sent out singing groups to go in, to churches on Sunday in, in the area and, and promote the college. Well, I never joined one of those groups. I, I, I did join one for the summer, but I didn't join it during the school year. I wanted to work at a church. Well, one of the singing members was sick, and they had a weekend uh, thing they were going to do, and they asked me to fill in his place, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. And there was a guy there on campus that sang in the group, and when he found out that I was going to be filling in that weekend... He got really upset. I didn't know it at the time, but he did not like me at all. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so I get a knock on my dorm room door. And his name was Todd. I said, Todd, come on in. Have a seat. I had a couch in my room, you know. And uh, he said, Mike, I got to talk to you. I said, okay, what about? He said, I heard that you were going to be singing with us this weekend. I said, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to it. He said, well, I'm not. I said, why? He said, all this time, he said, I've hated your guts. And I mean, you could, you could have knocked me down with a feather. 
And he said, I've always seen you as arrogant, braggadocious. Um, I don't like you. I don't like anything about you. God's been dealing with my heart about this thing. And he said, I don't want to go down and be in a foul mood all weekend and sing at some church trying to praise the Lord and me and be in a foul mood because you're standing next to me. And we talked. And we talked it all out. And after about an hour or two, we hugged each other. And from that day forward, we were best friends. We really were. We were best friends there. We did lots of stuff together, okay? But I had no idea that I had offended him. And that was a stone of offense that was in front of his life toward me. And I could, have, I could have been the most holy spiritual person on campus. But he despised me and he didn't want anything to do with me. I've had people in this church come to me. Pastor Mike, can I talk to you? Yeah, come on in. And one of them said, I want you to know that I've been harboring feelings of resentment against you for quite some time now. Really? Yeah. And I said, may I, may I ask what it was? And they told me that I had said something years ago. I don't remember it. I don't remember it. But I certainly wasn't going to stand there and say, well, I didn't say that. What do you accuse me of that for? I, Wrong play, people. Wrong play. I said, I, I honestly don't remember that, but you know what? It sounds like me. And I want you to know that I am very, very sorry for that. Will you forgive me? Yes, I will forgive you. I said, thank you. Thank you for coming to me. I wish you'd come to me sooner, but I'm glad that you came anyway. And after that, things have been fantastic. I had no idea I had offended this person. But I can do it, and I can do it very easily. People have left this church because of me. That's hard for me to that's hard for me to take. It's hard for me to take. So in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13. And I want you to think really good and hard about people that have you have offended, people you have rolled a stone of offense in front of them. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. And let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary. That's our God. God's a sanctuary. Amen. But for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both houses of Israel and for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. A gin is where we get the word engine. And what it is, it's, it's some sort of manufactured mechanical trap device that traps people, a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Now ask yourself this question. When Jesus came, for a while, he had thousands of people following him wherever he went. But on the night before he went to the cross, where were they? All of them were saying, crucify him, crucify him. Even Peter was saying that. God, and God did this intentionally to Israel. He prophesied, he promised to send them their Messiah, the anointed one that was going to lead them out of captivity, bring them out of bondage, set up the kingdom of God here on this earth, and they would follow him. 
And when he sent Jesus, his only begotten son, God knew that the Jews would be offended at him and despise him and hate him. What does Isaiah 53 say about Christ? There's, there's nothing that when we look on him, there's, in, there's not anything to look at. He wasn't, he wasn't good looking. He wasn't this fair haired, handsome thing that we see on paintings and, you know, hymn books and things like that. He didn't look anything like that. I don't know what he looked like, but there was no comeliness in his face. He was an offense to the Jews. And to this day, you cannot, I mean, witnessing to a Jew probably is the hardest thing in the world to do. Because they, to them, Christ is a Gentile God invented by Gentiles. They want nothing to do with him. They want nothing to do with the New Testament. They have refused him now for thousands of years and they will continue to refuse him until when? Until the day that God removes the stone of offense away from them. You see how it works? You see now why Jesus said what he said. You take away the stone. I've told this story before. I'm, I'm telling you, giving you my examples of it. Um, let me read this passage. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the lion and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the hiding place. Uh, first Peter chapter two. He's using that as a reference unto you, therefore, which believe he's precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. How many people, how many people do you think you can go out and talk to? I, I'm talking about adults now. And ask them, did you, were you ever made to go to church as a child? Yes. I was dragged to church every Sunday. I had to sit in Sunday school class. I had to sit and listen to that preacher preach. I had to sit and watch those hypocrites in that church act all holy and spiritual. And I knew them outside the church. I knew they were nothing but devils. They were drunkards. They were whoremongers. Some of them were buying drugs off of people I knew. I knew those people and I knew they weren't righteous. I knew they were a fake and a phony. And I wouldn't give you a dime for a box full of churches. I won't. And I won't go to one ever again. They say, oh, churches are full of hypocrites. Are they right? Yes. Yes, a thousand times yes. We offend people by our righteous indignation. We take on, and I, boy, I'm good at this. We take on a holier than thou thing about us. And, I, and, and I'll tell you, you're, you're real easy to spot nowadays. All you people that are holier than thou, you are very easy to detect. All I have to do is look at your Facebook post for about 10 minutes. And I can tell that you are somebody who believes that God called you to offend everybody around you on purpose with your mouth, with your sayings, with your judgmental attitude putting everybody down for every little thing that you think that they're doing wrong, but you will not take into account your own hypocrisy. It is no wonder that Google, Yahoo, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, the guy that owns Twitter is a, is a pothead. He's a marijuana smoking dope fiend billionaire that has already censored the president of the United States, cut him off, censors free speech on there, and 
They're, they're moving in toward, they're going to start censoring the gospel. You watch and see. Why? They hate churches, they hate church people, and it's because of the actions of church people and their preachers that have done it. We have rolled a stone of offense in front of this entire world because we felt that we were holier than everybody else. Brother Tim Barron's. By the way, I, I want to say, you people, God bless you. There's more money has come in for Brother Tim for his trip to Mexico. And I, I, can't even, I haven't even counted it up yet. Rose is letting me know what's come in. I, want to, I just want to thank everybody. I know Tim will rejoice. But he was right. Sunday afternoons at the restaurants, the people hate the church crowd. You want to work Sunday? I ain't working Sunday. I can't stand those people when they come in here with their hair and their neckties and holier-than-thou attitude, throwing food on the floor. Their kids are brats, tearing up everything. They're rude. They don't tip. They just leave me a little gospel track, and they think that's going to, that's going to feed my family. I'm not against leaving gospel tracks, but leave it, put a $50 bill in there and leave it. You want to get their attention? Throw a 50 in there. They'll read it then. Guarantee you they will. My sister, she worked at a restaurant. She knows that Sunday crowd, everybody hated them. It's a bunch of puffed up, arrogant church people who think, that because they are going to inherit the earth one day, we might as well take our share now. I offended our neighbor one year by yelling at her son because he kept coming over to her on our playground while we had school kids. Until God dealt with me and said, Mike, you're going to go make that right. And I went over to her house, knocked on her door. And her son answered the door. And I said, is your mom home? He said, well, she's taking a nap. I said, well, I think she'll want to talk to me. So why don't you go wake her up? She come to the door and just cold. You could see the coldness there. And I said, I just want you to know that God's been dealing with me, and I'm very, very sorry for how I treated you and your son. And her face just began to melt. And her jaw, she literally went. And I said, I should have never been that way. It was wrong of me to do that. And from now on, if he wants to come, as long as our kids are not out there playing, if he wants to come and play on our playground, he's more than welcome to. And she almost broke down in tears. And you know what she said to me? She said, me and my husband have thought about getting back in church. We'll be at your Sunday. And they were there. And we had a fantastic relationship after that. We were... We were Loving our neighbor as ourself. A couple of Jehovah's Witness ladies came to my door one time. Sterling was with me. And it was on a Saturday, and boy, I let them have it. I let them, I, I came unglued on them. I just shot verses of scripture used it as a spear toward them and I hit them with everything I had and God even dealt with me about that Mike you know those people are lost yeah I do who's going to save them now because they're not going to listen to you so on a Thursday night I went down here to 110 highway to that Jehovah's Witness now, you want to talk about a weird spirit. 
me walking into that building, they don't let visitors come. Me walking into that building, immediately, that, that got everybody's attention. Who is this man? What is he doing here? And I said, I'm looking for two ladies that came by my house a while back, and I told them where I lived. And they said, well, that's not our precinct. That belongs to the place over at Cedar Hill. And I said, well, I did not treat them very well when they came to my house. And I just wanted to let them know that I am very sorry for how I treated them. And I wanted them to know that I loved them. And um, they said, well, you know, we, we, we don't know who they were, so we can't tell. And so I left, and I got in touch with Brady. He was still going there at the time. And I told him about it, and he said, I know who you're talking about. I said, will you please deliver a message to me for them that I'm very sorry for how I treated them and how I spoke to them and ask them would they forgive me. Take that stone away. Now, I've told you all about myself, about how easily I can offend people. I have a feeling I'm not the only one here that does. We offend people. We, we want to be right in every debate. We want to have the last word. Our pride gets in us. We want, to, we want to take the hill. We want to take the high ground. We want to stomp down everybody that's in our path. And we think that we have already become the body of Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, when we think this is the battle of Armageddon, we're going to destroy all the sinners out of the way, and this is how it's going to be. And I want to tell you something else. God had to deal with me. I told you about that sodomite that I led to the Lord. God had to deal with me about that. To, before I said yes, my, I, was, I was going to say no. Mike, don't you say no. You say yes, that you'll go see him and talk to him. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll meet you up there, St. John's Hospital. I'll talk to him. I wasn't expecting much, but you know that man's in heaven right now. I have no doubt about it whatsoever. Yes, sir. Roy, you have said... You, You know, even Alcoholics Anonymous tells you that part of your recovery is to go to the people that you have offended and try to mend that and make it right. Okay? I'm just telling you. And what happens is we come into church and we weep and cry and put on a big show about, oh, oh, my son, he won't get saved. Oh, my husband, he's lost. <laughs> you act like you just can't take it another day that he's not saved. But the way you live in front of him, and the way you live around these lost people, it would embarrass you greatly if they actually came into church to see you sitting there. Because you know how you have acted toward them outside of the church. The truth of it is, you, you might want them saved, but you don't want them saved here. That's Mary and Martha saying, Lord, don't, don't take that son away. He stinks. His sin's too bad. He's too far gone. He is, he's an evil person. There's no telling what he'll say. There's, he, might, he, might, he might even curse. He might... He'll use F words all around. I, in fact, I don't want that. So just, no, don't go talk to him because that, that might hurt. That, that, that just might make everything. Listen. 
You're the one that wants the stone there. You put it in place. You want it kept there. Ask God, is there anybody, God, that I've offended that I need to go to and make things right? Lisa and I had a pastor's wife come to us just recently at a camp meeting. She said, can I talk to you two? And I said, yeah. And she said, remember when you all, you came out to our church and preached there? And I said, yeah. And she said, I want to apologize for my behavior that day. She said, you guys came to our house, you ate dinner. She's, and I don't remember much of it. But apparently, we were not as welcome as we thought. And she, it had been bothering her. And this happened, I mean, 10 years ago. She came to us and said, will you forgive me for how I treated you guys that day? I looked at Lisa and I'm going, I don't, I don't remember you treating us anyway. Maybe in the back of my mind, it did seem like she was quiet. But when God dealt with her, she did it. And I just want to, I want to tell you people, you really are not any better than anybody else in this nasty, stinking world. You can put on the religious garb and talk the religious talk all you want to. But you're not better than they are. You, you have been given grace by a merciful God. Why is it that the people that you offend are not deserving of the same grace that you have received. Take away the stone. Take away the stone.